The Geese by Herman Melville, read for Noetic by Luke Johnson. This recording copyright 2020 Noetic Series LLC, all rights reserved. The Geese. In relating to my friends various passages of my seagoings, I have at times had occasion to allude to that singular people, the Geese, sometimes as casual acquaintances, sometimes as shipmates. Such allusions have been quite natural and easy. For instance, I have said the two Geese, just as another would say the two Dutchmen or the two Indians. In fact, being myself so familiar with geese, it seemed as if all the rest of the world must be. But not so. My auditors have opened their eyes as much as to say, what under the sun is a gee? To enlighten them, I have repeatedly had to interrupt myself, and not without detriment to my stories, to remedy which inconvenience. A friend hinted the advisability of writing out some account of the geese and having it published. Such as they are, the following memoranda spring from that happy suggestion. The word gi, G hard, is an abbreviation by seamen of Portuguese, the corrupt form of Portuguese. As the name is a curtailment, so the race is a residuum. Some three centuries ago, certain Portuguese convicts were sent as a colony to Fogo, one of the Cape de Verdes, off the northwest coast of Africa, an island previously stocked with an aboriginal race of Negroes, ranking pretty high in civility, but rather low in stature and morals. In course of time, from the amalgamated generation, all the likelier sort were drafted off as food for powder and the ancestors of the sense-called geese were left as the caput mortem, or melancholy, remainder. Of all men, seamen have strong prejudices, particularly in the matter of race. They are bigots here, but when a creature of inferior race lives among them an inferior tar, there seems no bound to their disdain. Now, as ere long will be hinted, the gi, though of an aquatic nature, does not, as regards higher qualifications, make the best of sailors. In short, by seamen, the abbreviation gi was hit upon in purely contumely, the degree of which may be partially inferred from this, that with them the primitive word portugie itself is a reproach so that gi, being a subtle distillation from that word, stands in point of relative intensity to it, as adder of roses does to rose water. At times when some crusty old sea dog has his spleen more than unusually excited against some luckless blunderer of Fogo, his shipmate, it is marvelous the prolongation of taunt into which he will spin out the one little exclamatory monosyllable gee the isle of fogo that is fire isle was so called from its volcano which after throwing up an infinite deal of stones and ashes finally threw up business altogether from its broadcast bounteousness having been bankrupt but thanks to the volcano's Prodigality in its time, the soil of Fogo is such as may be found on a dusty day on a road newly macadamized. Cut off from farms and gardens, the staple food of the inhabitants is fish, at catching which they are expert. But none the less do they relish ship biscuit, which indeed by most islanders, barbarous or semi barbarous, is held a sort of lozenge. In his best estate, the gi is rather small, he admits it, but with some exceptions, hardy, capable of enduring extreme hard work, hard fare, or hard usage, as the case may be. In fact, upon a scientific view, there would seem a natural adaptability in the gi to hard times generally, a theory not uncorroborated by his experiences, and furthermore, that kindly care of nature in fitting him for them. 
something as for his hard rubs with a hardened world fox the Quaker fitted himself, namely in a tough leather suit from top to toe. In other words, the gi is by no means of that exquisitely delicate sensibility expressed by the figurative adjective thin-skinned. His physicals and spirituals are in singular contrast. The gi has a great appetite but little imagination, a large eyeball but small insight. Biscuit he crunches but sentiment he eschews. His complexion is hybrid, his hair ditto, his mouth disproportionately large as compared with his stomach, his neck short but his head round, compact, and betokening a solid understanding. Like the Negro, the gi has a peculiar savor, but a different one, a sort of wild marine gamey savor as in the seabird called Hadglate. Like venison, his flesh is firm but lean. His teeth are what are called butter teeth, strong, durable, square, and yellow. Among captains at a loss for better discourse during dull, rainy weather, in the horse latitudes, much debate has been had whether his teeth are intended for carnivorous or herbivorous purposes, or both conjoined. But as on his isle the gi eats neither flesh nor grass, this inquiry would seem superfluous. The native dress of the gi is, like his name, compendious. His head being by nature well thatched, he wears no hat. Want to wade much in the surf, he wears no shoes. He has a serviceably hard heel, a kick from which is by the judicious held almost as dangerous as one from a wild zebra. Though for a long time a back no stranger to the seafaring people of Portugal, the Gui, until comparatively recent period, remained almost undreamed of by seafaring Americans. It is now some forty years since he first became known to certain masters of our Nantucket ships, who commenced the practice of touching at Fogo on the outward passage, there to fill up vacancies among their crews arising from the short supply of men at home. By degrees, the custom became pretty general, till now the gi is found aboard of almost one whaler out of three. One reason why they are in request is this. An unsophisticated gi coming on board a foreign ship never asks for wages. He comes for biscuit. He does not know what wages mean, unless cuffs and buffets be wages, of which sort he receives a liberal allowance paid with great punctuality, besides perquisites of punches thrown in now and then. But for all this, some persons there are, and not unduly biased by partiality to him either, who still insist that the gi never gets his due. His docile services being thus cheaply to be had, some captains will go the length of maintaining that gi sailors are preferable, indeed every way physically and intellectually superior to American sailors. Such captains complaining and justly that American sailors, if not decently treated, are apt to give serious trouble. But even by their most ardent admirers, it is not deemed prudent to sail a ship with none but geese, at least if they chance to be all green hands, a green gee being of all green things the greenest besides owing to the clumsiness of their feet ere improved by practice in the rigging, green geese are wont in no inconsiderable numbers to fall overboard the first dark squally night, insomuch that when unreasonable owners insist with a captain against his will upon a green gee crew for, and aft he will ship twice as many geese as he would have shipped of Americans, so as to provide for all contingencies. The geese are always ready to be shipped. Any day one may go to their isle, and on the showing of a coin of biscuit over the rail may load down to the water's edge with them. But though any number of geese are ever ready to be shipped, still it is by no means well to take them as they come. There is a choice even in geese. Of course, the gee has his private nature as well as his public coat. To know geese, to be a sound judge of geese, one must study them. Just as to know and be a judge of horses, one must study horses. Simple as for the most part are both horse and gee, 
In neither case can knowledge of the creature come by intuition. How unwise, then, in those ignorant young captains who, on their first voyage, will go and ship their geese at Fogo without any preparatory information or even so much as taking convenient advice from a gee jockey. By a gee jockey is meant a man well-versed in geese. Many a young captain has been thrown and badly hurt by a gee of his own choosing, for notwithstanding the general docility of the gee when green, it may be otherwise with him when ripe. Discreet captains won't have such a gee. Away with that ripe gee, they cry. That smart gee, that knowing gee. Green geese for me. For the benefit of inexperienced captains about to visit Fogo, the following may be given as the best way to test a gee. Get square before him at, say, three paces, so that the eye, like a shot, may rake the gee fore and aft, at one glance taking in his whole make and build. How he looks about the head, whether he carry it well, his ears are they over lengthy. How fares it in the withers? His legs, does the gee stand strongly on them? His knees, any Belshazzar symptoms there? How stands it in the regions of the brisket, etc., etc.? Thus far, bone and bottom, for the rest draw close to, and put the center of the pupil of your eye. Put it, as it were, right into the gee's eye, even as an eye stone, gently but firmly slip it in there, and then note what speck or beam of viciousness, if any, will be floated out. All this and more must be done, and yet, after all, the best judge may be deceived. But on no account should the shipper negotiate for his gee with any middleman, himself a gee, because such and one must be a knowing gee who will be sure to advise the green gee what things to hide and what to display to hit the skipper's fancy which, of course, the knowing gee supposes to lean toward as much physical and moral excellence as possible. The rashness of trusting to one of these middlemen was forcibly shown in the case of the gee, who by his countrymen was recommended to a new Bedford captain as one of the most agile gees in Fogo. There he stood straight and stout in a flowing pair of man-of-war's man trousers, uncommonly well fitted out. True, he did not step around much at the time, but that was diffidence. Good, they shipped him. But at the first taking in of sail, the gee hung fire. Come to look, both trouser legs were full of elephantiasis. It was a long sperm whaling voyage, useless as so much lumber, that every port prohibited from being dumped ashore. The That elephantine gee, ever crunching biscuit, for three weary years, was trundled round the globe. Grown wise by several similar experiences, old Captain Hosea Keene of Nantucket, in shipping a gi, at present manages matters thus. He lands at Fogo in the night by secret means, gains information where the likeliest gi wanting to ship lodges, whereupon, with a standing party, he surprises all the friends and acquaintances of that gi putting them under guard with pistols at their heads, then creeps cautiously toward the gee, now lying wholly unawares in his hut, quite relaxed from all possibility of displaying aught deceptive in his appearance, thus silently, thus suddenly, thus unannounced, Captain Keene bursts upon his gee, so to speak, in the very bosom of his family. By this means, more than once, unexpected revelations have been made. A gi noised abroad for a Hercules in strength and an Apollo Belvedere for beauty. Of a sudden is discovered all in wretched heap, forlornly a droop as upon crutches, his legs looking as if broken at the cartwheel. Solitude is the house of candor, according to Captain Keene. In the stall, not the street, he says, resides the real nag. The innate disdain of regularly bred seamen toward geese receives an added edge from this. The geese undersell them, working for biscuit, where the sailors demand dollars. Hence, anything said by sailors to the prejudice of geese should be received with caution, especially that jeer of theirs. That monkey jacket was originally so called, from the circumstance, 
that that rude sort of shaggy garment was first known in Fogo. They often call a monkey jacket a gi jacket. However, this may be, there is no call to which the gi will with more alacrity respond than the word man. Is there any hard work to be done, and the geese stand round and sulks? Here, my men, cries the mate. How they jump but ten to one when the work is done is plain gee again. Here, gee, you gee. In fact, it is not unsurmised that only when extraordinary stimulus is needed, only when an extra strain is to be got out of them, are these hapless geese ennobled with the human name. As yet, the intellect of the gi has been a little cultivated. No well-attested educational experiment has been tried upon him. It is said, however, that in the last century, a young gi was by a visionary Portuguese naval officer sent to Salamanca University. Also among the Quakers of Nantucket, there has been talk of sending five comely gis aged 16 to Dartmouth College. That venerable institution as is well known, having been originally founded partly with the object of finishing off wild Indians in the classics and higher mathematics. Two qualities of the Gi, which with his docility may be justly regarded as furnishing a hopeful basis for his intellectual training, is his excellent memory and still more excellent credulity. The above account may perhaps among the ethnologists raise some curiosity to see a gi. But to see a gi, there is no need to go all the way to Fogo, no more than to see a Chinaman to go all the way to China. Gis are occasionally to be encountered in our seaports, but more particularly in Nantucket and New Bedford. But these gis are not the gis of Fogo. That is, they are no longer green gis. They are sophisticated gis, and hence liable to be taken for naturalized citizens badly sunburnt. Many a Chinaman, in a new coat and pantaloons, his long cube coiled out of sight in one of Guinan's hats, has promenaded Broadway and been taken merely for an eccentric Georgia planter. The same with geese, a stranger need have a sharp eye to know a gee, even if he see him. Thus much for a general sketchy view of the gee. For further and fuller information, apply to any sharp-witted American whaling captain, but more especially to the before-mentioned old Captain Hosea Keene of Nantucket, whose address at present is Pacific Ocean.